Hey everyone, thank you for coming to listen to me talk about refactoring for a bit. Um, I'm going to explain some extremely simple refactoring techniques. Uh, firstly, to show you that refactoring is really easy. And secondly, to show you that it's really worthwhile doing. Um, everything I'm going to mention is stuff that I use pretty much every day. It's what I have in mind when I do any code reviews for JDLT and any time that I'm looking at code I didn't write because as well as these being things that you can use to improve uh, you know, your code or code that you're working on, it's also really helpful, I find, just to understand the code that you didn't write um, if it's something you find intimidating. So as an example, I'm going to show you how you can make really complicated seeming code a lot easier to understand by doing very simple things like just adding more variables to them. Uh, as for the title of the talk, Refactoring, Yes You Should and Yes You Can, um, most people I think would agree with the should part, but when you get to the can you lose some people and as far as I'm concerned that's just a matter of confidence. Um, I think anyone in this room is definitely totally capable of really competent and helpful refactoring and probably most people who can code at all. Um, because you can actually get a long way just by applying the principles you learned like day one of coding. Uh, so the aim for this talk is basically to convince you that you can probably do more refactoring than you currently do do um, and that nothing will set on fire when you try basically. So uh, before we start I do want to point out that you may not learn anything about programming or even refactoring and if you don't then I'm going to count that as a victory because as I said, I just want to show you that it's easy and you know how to do it. And if anything, you may be lacking the confidence. So if you finish this and you think, well, that's all really easy. I don't know why I wasted this time going to this lunch and learn. I was right. And that's the takeaway. And that's the important thing. So uh, before we start, I'm going to sort of show you a working definition of refactoring, uh, which is changing existing code in such a way that it A, does exactly the same thing as before, while B is improved in some non-functional way. Uh, examples of non-functional ways they might be improved, it's more readable, it's more maintainable, there's less complexity, and it's more reusable. This is definitely not the only definition of refactoring, it's probably quite a narrow one, but uh, you, know, you can probably talk for about as long as you want uh, about refactoring, and how long people will listen to you talk about refactoring is probably less than that, so it's going to be fairly closely scoped. Um, so the aim of refactoring, again, can vary hugely, but these are the things that I'm going to focus on. Um, giving the next developer that's going to work with that code the best user experience while they're working with it, basically. So you want them to be able to understand it quickly, to change it easily, and basically we want to write code with the intent of making it easy for humans to read and interact with. So we're not going to worry too much about how efficient the code is um, and what the computer thinks of it because well, all this code is going to be JavaScript and JavaScript will basically run no matter what. So it's just going to be about how the next person to read it is going to find it. Um, as I say, these aren't the only values that you can think about while you're refactoring and there are huge books written about refactoring, especially for more technical stuff about increasing efficiency and covering all those things enormously out of scope but I do have a slide at the end which covers a couple of uh, resources if you're really interested in refactoring uh, with some books on there as well. So, the way to learn to refactor, in my opinion, and actually the way to learn anything, is to start with really simple rules of thumb. So we're going to take broadly applicable rules about code, like more variables make something easier to understand, and then you should just apply it wherever possible, whenever you're writing code, whenever you're working with someone else's code, all the time. And you should just focus on this one thing, more variables make something more readable, for example, until you reach a point where you don't actually have to consciously think about it anymore because it's become a natural part of your thought process when you're writing code. And then you can pick another rule of thumb and you can do the same thing. And you can basically keep going uh, like that until, without really thinking about it, you are able to just refactor the code because you just are used to doing these things almost as a kind of a muscle memory um, and you really want to focus on maximizing sort of your bang for buck in terms of how much effort it's going to take to learn these things and be able to do them versus the improvement to the code. So for that reason we are going to focus on uh, rules of thumb which are really really broadly applicable uh, 
Um, pretty much everything in this slideshow will be relevant, whatever language you're writing in, but maybe a couple of things are specific to JavaScript. Um, but they're all things that you can get a lot of use out of. And as I say, this is my approach to learning most things, uh, which is why, I mean, if anyone asks me for advice on a UI they're designing, I'll probably tell them to use negative space rather than borders and to vary font weight rather than font size, because those are two really easy things to learn that you can just say and, you know, sort of leave you alone. But it will really improve their, how something looks really simply. And for UX as well, I will say, well, don't let me click on something if you know that from the current state of the application that that click won't work. You should warn me about that in advance. And I'll say, don't rely on hover states because they won't work on mobile. And now you're all going to notice how often I say those things. So I'm going to have to like, learn more about UX and UI. Um, yes, we're not going to do anything complicated or niche here. And it's really important that you don't worry about over applying this rule or any of these rules because they're all so broad and so simple that while there's a really, you know, maybe there's a chance it won't make a big improvement to the code, it's not going to make anything worse, you know, 99.9% .9 of the time. And even if it does, everything's version controlled, so basically don't worry about it. Um, and by the time you are doing these things sort of naturally, you'll probably have started to figure out the edge cases anyway, and you'll have, you'll have a more sophisticated understanding of it rather than just using it as a rule of thumb. Uh, and just before we go on to the rules, I want to point out that nobody's first draft of any code they write ever is optimal, whatever it is you want to optimize for. There's always improvements you can make, and that's absolutely fine. So I don't want to make anyone sort of sit here and worry that, oh, I don't do these things when I'm writing code first. That's absolutely fine. We're talking about refactoring, not about writing perfect code uh, immediately. Um, I would not be qualified to give that talk. And I also don't want anyone to freak out in the future about these rules and thinking, oh, wait, am I applying that rule right now as I go? Just make the code work the first time, get it to do what you want to do, and then you can refactor it. And again, once you get used to these rules of thumb and you are unconsciously doing them, you'll find that you do do some of these things in your own code without needing to refactor, but definitely don't worry about needing, wanting to do all of them all the time or anything like that without thinking about it. Cool. So, good talk about some rules and the, I want to point out that this is not an exhaustive list. Um, so if you want to know why I didn't include something, uh, it might be because I didn't want this to be a three hour talk. It might be because I never thought about it. Um, but if you do have something you do, I'll be interested to hear what it is and maybe we can share some at the end. So rule number one, more variables are better, broadly speaking. More variables you've got in some code you've written, the more English you've got on the page because you get to choose what your variables are called. And the more English you've got on the page, the more opportunities you have to communicate meaning and to communicate your intent to the next person who's looking at this code. Um, this is more intuitive for numbers and strings and booleans, etc. Uh, but it is absolutely valid for functions as well. So if you've got a map or a reduce and you're passing a function into that map or that reduce, by default, most people will tend to just pass in an anonymous function, and then you need to read that function to figure out what it does. But if you put that function to a variable and you give it a name, then the person who's just scanning through the code just needs to read that name to know what's happening. Um, so whatever type of variable it would be, you're probably going to get some benefit out of it. Uh, this also allows you to get rid of magic values. And a magic value is a value that's got an um, very specific purpose, but it's not documented. So it might be a connection string, uh, it might be some kind of ID for something in an application, and if you've just got it there as a string or a number and it's being passed into a function and you've not seen what that function is, you've basically got no idea what's going on. But if you call this thing connection string or you call it ID for whatever that thing is, suddenly everything makes a lot more sense. Um, and doing this will also increase reusability of your code a lot because it means that when you come to add on uh, to this code later or someone else does, they can basically uh, swap in variables rather than figuring out, well, what is the variable in this? Uh, you know, logically, what is the variable? Put it into a code variable and then start doing that. So here is an example of some code. I'm going to give you a little bit of time to look at it, decide that it looks horrible, and then try and figure out what it does. Um, you can probably guess, being as we're talking about adding variables, what I'm going to suggest would improve this code. Um, but before I show you what I would do to refactor it, 
I will give you just a little bit more time to have a look at it. Anybody feel like they know what it does or does everyone feel like you've got it suitably impressed upon you that it's unclear at first what it does, things like that? You are allowed to answer. Okay, you have to answer. <laughs> this is getting awkward now. Um, so we've got a function, it's called check user profiles complete, and it takes some user IDs. And then we see, okay, it's an arrow function, and it's not got any curly braces, so it's going to just return whatever is inside that first set of parentheses. And it's going to await promise to all, so we need an array inside the promise to all. Okay, we're getting that by mapping over the user IDs, and when we map over that, we take each ID, and we call get user service with a random string. Don't know what that is, we'll come back to it. Uh, then we have to call dot get on the result of get user service, and we pass the ID into that, and by that point, I'm done. I have no idea what's going on, and I'm going to take a walk away from my desk because I'm upset. Come back, and you say, okay, and actually we're going to call reduce on that as well. And then we're going to do some more stuff with it, and then we get to, okay, well, the default value is true, but obviously you've forgotten about everything else that you had to try and understand beforehand. So basically, this is really complicated code, but it's not trying to do anything that's complicated. And here's what it can look like if you just add a couple more variables in. So where we've called get user service in the first example, we're passing in a connection string for something that's going to get, a, get us access to a service. So if we have that on process.env, obviously there's other benefits to that, like you're not committing secrets to code, which is nice. Um, suddenly it's really clear what's happening there. Then we get our user promises, and we just say, well, that's the result of our user IDs map, and then we can just await all those promises, and finally we can return the result of a reduce on the users which we got from those promises, and we've named the function that we're passing into the reduce. There are things there that I've put into variables which maybe you actually wouldn't need to. The reduce, for example, excuse me, that perhaps doesn't add that much clarity, um, but it definitely doesn't hurt. And what I tend to do is put everything that I possibly can fit into a variable into one, and then go backwards from there if I feel like, well, actually, I've written more code than I need to because of how many things I've put in. Um, so, if you do come across code where, well, it looks anything like that, then definitely start putting more variables in. Um, so the first rule of thumb is, if lots of stuff is going on and it's hard to keep track of, try adding more variables. And as I say, you might remove some, but there's no problem with that because um, yeah, you're refactoring and that's a, an ongoing process. Um, as well as adding more variables, you should give them better names. Um, if you come across some variables which don't have good names, if it's not in code that you wrote, if it is in code that you've written, whatever, change them. Um, and I'm going to patronize you now by telling you some rules about how to name variables. And you know them all, and everyone who's written any code knows them all, but we all still don't use them. Um, function names start with a verb, really simple, lets you know that something's a function, which is especially important in JavaScript because you can do weird stuff with functions. You can start passing them around into other functions and then they can call functions, which pass the, a function that calls a function. And if you don't know those things are functions, you're just not going to have a good time. Function names start with a verb. Um, Non-function names are a noun or a noun phrase. And then you know they're not functions. So, you know, exactly the same thing. Booleans start with is or has or can or basically something that if you use the right inflection, you can make it sound like a question. Um, and that will be true or false as the answer to the question. Brevity is good for variable names, but it's not more important than clarity. So a lot of people just absolutely hate long variable names and will do anything they can, up to and including making the code do different stuff so that they can write a variable name that makes sense but is also short. Which, you know, fine. I suppose a certain amount of respect for really sticking to your guns by doing that. But I don't think it's the best way. Um, brevity is nice. It makes code sort of look cleaner on the page. But clarity is absolutely the more important thing. Uh, there are some conventions, though, that make really short names really clear. For example, lowercase i means index, and everyone kind of, uh, gets very used to that pretty quickly. Um, if you've got max size as a variable name, that's as descriptive as maximum size. Or in a reducer, uh, ACC ac is probably as descriptive as accumulator for the first argument to your inner function. Um, so there's, it's worth thinking about that, because sometimes you can get brevity for free, just because of the context that you're in. Um, making the type 
of the variable obvious from the name is really important and really useful and really easy to not do because when you're writing code you probably know what type is that you're dealing with so you don't actively think about what that type is and how to make it clear so just as a really obvious example num months should be a number but months would be an array of some months you will very often see code that has a variable with the name like months which is actually the number of them and you'll make all kinds of assumptions about how that's going to work and you'll write some code and it will just do weird stuff and eventually you'll figure out it was just because three characters weren't on the front of uh, the name of the variable and then you can say to the person who wrote months rather than num months because they love brevity well how long did it take you to write three characters on your keyboard how long did it take me to figure out that's what it was and then come and have this conversation with you um, and include units where applicable as well. And there's a little code example of what I'm talking about with that. You've got a function called update time, and it's going to take uh, hours spent from state. It's got a, uh, some input called time spent. Already, before you get to uh, updating the state a little bit further down, it's kind of unclear what's going to go on. Uh, should you be doing hours spent plus time spent is the new number of hours spent or do you need to divide time spent by 60 because you don't know what units any of this stuff is in so if I with either of those two lines in there if I saw that code I would not trust that it was going to necessarily do what was intuitive to me if I could even figure out what would be intuitive um, whereas if you just always use the units you just remove kind of any possibility for ambiguity or vagueness in Visual Studio Code, you can press uh, Fn and F2, and you can rename something everywhere that it appears. You can do this in any IDE, but I don't know what the other shortcuts are, so you have to figure out those yourself. But it's just extraordinarily useful. Uh, I use it constantly just while I'm navigating code when I'm looking at it for the first time. Um, and yeah, use it liberally because it, it helps. And definitely don't worry about breaking something by renaming a variable. If you use the tools that are in your IDE to do it, it will rename it everywhere that it's needed. I think the only thing that sometimes um, it, Visual Studio Code gets a bit confused about is when you've got uh, object destructuring and you, you might have to delete a colon basically after you've done that. But if you've got ESLint set up then you'll know pretty quickly. So it's definitely more valuable to use it often and fix it the couple of times it breaks rather than don't use it. So, second rule of thumb, if a variable name is vague, ambiguous, misleading about its type, or longer than it needs to be, change it. This one is specific to JavaScript. Um, array methods, and which one you use to achieve something, before you even look at how you use it, the choice of array method describes and communicates your intent to the next person who looks at the code. These are some array methods. Hopefully, you're familiar with at least some of them. Um, you can usually get away with using the wrong one, or very often you can get away with using the wrong one. The last one in the list for each, uh, you can pass that a function, and for every member of an array, it will run that function. And it might be that actually uh, you want to do what realistically is a map. You want to take every item of the array and you want to create a new array, new array by doing the same operation on each member of that. So you can call a map and you can do that. Or you can call a map and you can do an operation on every member of the array that doesn't even return something. You just want to send it off to uh, an API somewhere and you don't care about what comes back. Realistically that's a for each because you just want to do a thing for each member of the array. But you can put that in a map and the, the map will iterate over everything and it will do the function for each member of the array, but then the person who reads the code will go, huh, the map is calling a function that doesn't return anything. So now I'm going to get a new array which is full of undefined. This looks like something really seriously wrong with the code. And then eventually you'll realize that, well, when the map is getting called, the result isn't even getting put into an array. So either map is just being used wrong or there's an even bigger problem with the code. And actually the code works fine because you can get away with weird stuff in JavaScript, but it's really confusing for the next person. These are examples of stuff that you can put into some of those array methods. Um, some of them, it probably seems fairly obvious which array method you're likely to put that into. Uh, C, for example, is just 
the number seven. You can't put that into a map or into a, a for each because you'll get a typo that says seven is not a function and the for each or the map will try and run it as a function. So that won't work. But when you've got uh, f, which is a function that just returns seven, you can put that in just about any of those array methods and it won't throw an error. It will just run it and do weird, unexpected stuff. And that actually goes for a really surprising number of the things you've got on the right. Um, obviously, a at the top there, that looks like it's going to be the function to go inside a reduce. Uh, inside a reduce, you pass a function where the first two arguments are uh, your accumulator, so something you're creating out of the array, and the second thing is the current member of the array that you are looking at. But in JavaScript, if you pass in, uh, if you have a function and you don't pass in all the arguments to it, then you'll just get undefined. So this would still run even though item was undefined, and then you'd stop getting weird stuff coming out in your uh, array, whether you put it into a reduce or not. Most of that information you're probably never going to use, but I thought it was kind of interesting. The main takeaway is you can go really far away from doing the right thing inside an array uh, with an array method before it actually will break 100% of the time. So just think about what you want to do with your array, and then you can use this handy little slide to figure out which method you should use. So if you want to create a new array of the same length but with different content, you just call the map. If you want to perform some action for every member of an array, but you don't need to return a value, call for each. Um, for each is the main one, I think, that people maybe should use, but don't. You're most likely to want to refactor something, maybe to be a, a for each, because the only criteria for using it is we well, want to do something for each member of the array. And most array methods will iterate through it and let you do something for each member of the array. They will just also do other stuff. The person who comes and reads the code is going to expect that you wanted the other stuff, and that's where the confusion will come from. Um, if you want to know whether some member uh, uh, meets some criteria, so obviously I've made a mistake there, includes is whether it's got a specific value in, whether it meets some criteria is dot sum. Um, if you want to know whether a member meets the criteria and you want to reference it later, then you want dot .find. And that is a change that I make in my own code constantly. I think, well, if the array has got this thing in it, then I'll do x, y, and z. And then a couple of minutes later, you realize, oh, actually, the x, y, and z are going to involve that member from the array, and you come back and you change it to dot .find. Um, you can use dot .filter, and then you can just choose the first item from the new array that you got from the filter. And that will work most of the time but it will be really confusing, again, to the next person who comes along. So you only want to use filter if you want uh, a new array of all the members which met the criteria. Uh, so rule of thumb, if there is a more specific array method that some code could use, change it so that it does use it. OK, ternaries. I think ternaries are really cool. And I talk about them all the time. Ternary is basically an if expression, and people find them really confusing. And I really think the only reason we find them confusing is that we learn about if statements first. Um, so we've got an if else statement here. We declare a let called state, and then we give state different value depending on whether or not five is greater than six. The equivalent with a ternary is to uh, just declare state equal to a ternary, where if five is greater than six, then the value comes out as math is broken. Otherwise, it comes out as all good. So what comes after the condition? You get your question mark. The uh, expression after that is what state will evaluate to if the condition was true. Then you get your column, which is basically an else. So if it wasn't true or truthy, then you will get all good in this case instead. And that's kind of all there is to a ternary. You can. Uh, Use it to decrease the number of return statements that you've got in a function, which personally I think can really help with the uh, clarity of a function, how readable it is. Because if you've only got one return statement in a function, then you know where to look to figure out what's going to come out of it. If you've got seven return statements nested in uh, lots of ifs and elses, then the probability of thinking you're hitting one when you're hitting the other is very high. Um, so here, you can see it's very similar to the first example, but it's just removing return statements rather than 
worrying about whether we've got a let or a const. And it's one of the other benefits actually of using a ternary is that it can sometimes let you avoid creating and then mutating variables, which is just another opportunity to get unexpected results uh, if you do have to do that. And one thing to remember about them is that they are kind of redundant for Booleans. So if you've got here uh, greater than, it's going to be true if A is greater than B, otherwise it's going to be false. The two lines of code there are completely equivalent because the expression uh, A greater than B is going to return a Boolean. If, you, if that Boolean is what you want and you don't want something else depending on it, then you just don't need the ternary. Uh, so rule of thumb number one about ternaries is if you can reduce the number of return statements or nested if and else blocks to the ternary, then do so. And the second rule of thumb is to use the term returnary. I've been trying to make this take off for a while now. If you return a ternary, it's just really obvious to me that I should be called a returnary. I'm struggling to get that, you know, gain traction. I'm hoping putting this on YouTube is really going to help, but spread the word is what I'm saying. Um, this one is kind of interesting, and it's something that I am currently in the process of trying to use as often as possible so that I learn to do it generally. Um, Basically, if you've got an array and you want to access the members of that array, that array by using an ID that is on those members, you might not actually want it to be an array. Uh, here you've got an example of an array of some chats and each one has an ID and a title. And then below that, you've got the same thing, but in an object instead. To access a chat that you want in the first one, you need to call .find and then you find the item whose ID matches the number that you're interested in. For the second one, you can just use square brackets to say, well, I will get, excuse me, the member uh, property with that key. Very often, if you've got a lot of data in an array, you're gonna call find a lot. And if you care about the order of that array uh, being maintained, then that probably is the best thing to do. But if you don't need the order to be kept uh, well, if you don't need to know what order they're in, you just want to access those bits of data individually, then quite often it is uh, just less code overall to use the object instead. And it's also really easy to turn that object into an array. You can call object.entries or object.keys or object.values to get um, either the key and the value, just the keys or just the values respectively. And it's more hassle to go in the other direction and try and reduce the array into an object. Uh, so. Rule of thumb, if you don't care about the order, but you do care about the IDs, then use an object instead. Okay, just before we talk about the next rule, we're gonna do a recap of primitive types and reference types in JavaScript. Primitive types are Boolean, numbers, string, undefined, and null. And basically the value of a variable of that type is literally a Boolean, number, string, undefined, or null then objects and arrays are reference types. And the value of the reference type is a reference, which is why it's called a reference type. Makes a lot of sense. Up to that point, everything after that about this is really confusing. Um, when you've got a reference type and you, well, if you take this example at the bottom here, you've got const a is an empty object, which is a reference type. And now we say b is equal to a. And we know now that a contains a reference to an empty object not the empty object itself, that means B has the same reference as the empty object. And this is why you can do weird stuff in JavaScript, like now say a.foo equals bar, and you actually also changed b.foo as well, because they're referencing the same uh, place in memory. And this all becomes relevant when you start talking about uh, pure functions and impure functions. Pure functions are functions which uh, don't affect anything outside of their own scope, which they um, and only operate on things which were passed into them directly. And they're much easier to reason about than the alternative impure functions. Um, and this all kind of comes about because the arguments that you get passed in to a function are copies of the value that existed outside and which you passed in. Um, but a copy of a reference still refers to the same place in memory. So if you then operate on the uh, argument to your function, it's going to affect everywhere that refers to that value outside of the function, if it was a reference type like an object. So this is just a very basic example. Uh, the function on the left is impure, 
a user object is passed in and then we increment the age property on it and we set the can drive property on it uh, and then we return the user. On the right you've got a pure version of that where you return a new object which is uh, constructed based on the user that was passed in. The one on the right basically shouldn't cause you any trouble. The one on the left is going to change the user object which exists in whatever scope where this function was called. And bear in mind that being as this is an async function, you don't actually know what might be happening at the same time as this as well. So if some of the functions are being called at the same time and they rely on the age or can drive property of the user, then really weird stuff will start happening and you'll have race conditions and it will just basically how uh, long can user drive takes to return could determine how your application behaves. And that's a really annoying kind of problem to debug, but quite an easy one to avoid if you're conscious about uh, using pure functions rather than impure functions. Uh, so rule of thumb, if you see an impure function, make it pure. Um, another one which, this took me a long time to become sold on, really, um, but I now am totally, is that comments should be used as a last resort. Um, there are a couple of very obvious types of comment which you should avoid. Uh, duplicating code in comments is just pointless. Uh, if you're going to tell me that get name uh, is going to split an email address on dot and then capitalize the first letters of the name, I could probably figure that out by looking at the function. Um, so there's no need for that. Or you might explain some complicated code in your function. So we've got the function we, uh, in your comment, sorry. And we've got the function that we looked at earlier. And now we get told by the comment, oh, well, this gets users with the IDs that are passed in, and then it checks that their profiles are complete. Which is fine, but if you need to write that comment, that probably suggests that the code was too unclear. Um, so the rule of thumb, if a comment is unnecessary, just remove it. And if it was being used in the place of clear code, and it was being used as a crutch to get away with writing code that wasn't very clear, then rewrite the code and then delete the comment. So, that's, those are all the rules that I'm going to go through um, because I th think even if you pick up one or two of those, variable names for example, I think make the most difference um, in terms of, well, bang for your buck. If you make that change in some code, the amount of complexity you reduce can be so high. Uh, you don't need to pick up any more than this in one go. You, you definitely could pick up a lot less than this in one go and start making really valuable changes to code that you're working with. Um, so these are signs, based on these rules of thumb, that you should consider whether something should be refactored. And they're absolutely not uh, cast in stone, you know, because something's got few variables, it might only need few variables. That's not a sign that you should refactor it, but it's a sign that you should think about it. Uh, so we've got few variables. Uh, if it's got unclear names, you definitely should change something. If it could use a more specific array method, then you should make sure that it does. If it's got lots of return statements uh, inside if and else statements, then there's a chance that actually that is a really considered approach and for one reason or another it is the most clear, but you should definitely start thinking about changing it based on that. Uh, obviously, if you've got ternaries for Booleans, you know you can just delete the second half of it. If you've got an array where the ID is important and the order isn't, then you know you can consider using an object instead. And if you've got a function mutating a value that exists outside of its scope, then you should definitely uh, refactor that. And again, with lots of comments, there's you know going to be situations where actually comments are really useful. If you've had to write some kind of weird code as a workaround to a bug with a library that you're using, maybe you'll put in comments to explain that that's why you've done this, or with a link to a GitHub issue or something like that. And that's an example of a really handy comment that does provide context for the next person. But if it's ever being used because it allows you to get away with less good code, then that's definitely time to refactor. Um, I mentioned at the beginning that I think the main reason people don't refactor or do less refactoring than they could or maybe should is about confidence. Um, and I've got four reasons here that someone might not do some refactoring. And I think they're all rubbish reasons, basically. Um, obviously, other people might have other reasons. I think this is based on my own experience, based on talking to other people. Um, I think these are the main ones. I've certainly felt all of these. 
If you think you're not good enough to change or improve or fix some code, you're probably wrong. Um, if the person who wrote it, well, if they were able to write this code and they uh, weren't able to make it clear, but you're able to recognize the problems with it, then the way that you should approach that is you should think, oh, okay, well, I was able to recognize the problems with it. I'm probably in a good position to try and fix those problems. Um, the, the person who wrote the code, it's unlikely that they were smarter than you uh, to an extent that is at all relevant here, if at all. Um, and you know, you can ask for help refactoring. Um, for me specifically, I really enjoy refactoring. Uh, if you want to distract me from whatever complicated thing I'm doing by asking me to refactor some code, I will be well up for that. Um, if you can't be bothered to change or improve or fix some code, then, well, that's not a great attitude. <laughs> It's a very understandable attitude, but it's not a great one. And you should just think about how annoying it is to read code that someone else wrote, which is, uh, well, does any, breaks any of the rules we've talked about and is therefore hard to read. And you know, we have just as much of an obligation to each other to refactor code that we think is like that as we do to uh, write code that is clear in the first place. Uh, if you're worried that the person who wrote it might get mad, either you are wrong or that person is wrong. Uh, they shouldn't get mad because it's just code. Code is going to change. And if it's better, then that is good. Uh, you can talk to them about it. Uh, you can get someone else to talk to both of you about it. And what I find is that if you get someone else involved in the process, if you say, oh, I've just read this code. Uh, I can see from Git you wrote it. I'm a little bit confused about how it worked. Do you think this alternative would work? Does that do the same thing, etc.? Rather than just going to someone and saying, hey, your code was bad and now it's not. That is gonna go down worse. Um, and you might think you don't trust your instinct that something actually needs changing. And that is probably wrong as well. Because if you found some code hard to follow and uh, you think about why, you'll probably either realize it breaks one of these uh, rules or it breaks some other rule um, that you can then change to improve it. And you, what you shouldn't ever think is that, well, this is so complicated, that must mean the person who wrote it is really smart because they're able to write this really complicated code. I can't understand this at all, so I definitely couldn't refactor it. Because then you're taking the negative thing, which is, well, this code is complicated, and you're turning that into a positive about someone else and a negative about you. Whereas actually you've realized that some code is non-optimal, um, hopefully you spotted some specific things and you're fixing about it, and that's really good. That is the most important step to doing any refactoring. You've seen in this presentation that a lot of the rules I've suggested are just stuff you learn right away when you start coding. It's like name a function with a verb at the beginning. Um, if someone hasn't been doing these things, then that's a negative about the code that has been written, not a negative about you. So you should just always be confident that if something seems confusing, it probably is. Which brings me on to this quote from our technical director, Tommy. He said this to me in oof, probably the first couple of months after I joined JDLT. Um, and I think it was probably a little bit flippant at the time, but there is value to it. Um, yeah, if something is done a certain way, has been done a certain way, um, and you know the person who wrote that code got away with it, that doesn't necessarily mean it was the best way to do something. Um, and this applies both for specific lines of codes, functions, applications that have been written, um, and much bigger things as well. I think it's an approach that we try and take with our clients, and we want them to understand that just because you've had a process in the past doesn't mean that that process is the way forward and actually you should accept that we can tell you about uh, better alternatives and we should absolutely have the same approach to ourselves and our own code and each other's code um, both in the sense that what we've talked about on the previous slide if you think something looks a bit dodgy then you should follow through on that but also if someone comes to you and says this code that you've written just I don't understand it um, it seems like it could be simpler, then you should absolutely be open to that as well because either you can have a conversation about it and um, actually it's simpler than it seemed something, and then the person who came to you is gonna learn something and that's great or you're about to learn how uh, you can make this thing simpler and then that's great as well. 
And that is my talk about refactoring. Um, I've got a couple of links here to books about refactoring clean code and a really good blog post about uh, bad comments. Um, those two books I have dipped in and out of um, because I had them freely available to me at a previous job. Um, they're huge and really, really thorough and they go into a lot of the topics around refactoring code to make them more efficient, uh, as well as some stuff around um, making it more user-friendly for the next developer. But if you want to know more about the efficiency side of things, then books like that are uh, really good and complicated, not like light before bed reading at all. And that's it. Does anyone have any questions about any of the stuff we talked about? Richard's got a question. What do I think about... Should we always avoid mutating objects or are there times when like, for readability it's okay to do it? Uh, I definitely think that you should always avoid mutating objects if it's at all possible and that it's usually possible. Um, I think that there can be a trade-off, which I think is what you're getting at about um, the readability or the length, usually the length of some code. If you choose not to mutate a value, then you'd probably need to recreate it or create a new variable which contains the same value and then add stuff to it. Um, and I, I think that trade-off is normally worth it in favor of not mutating the code, but you know, never say never. I can believe that there are some examples where that's not the case, but again, as a rule of thumb, the approach I would take is just um, don't mutate stuff and then Maybe you do find edge cases around that, and then you can apply those as you go. But all these things in here, I would say, um, you won't make anything much worse, I guess is what I said at the beginning. And if you make the code a little bit longer, but you avoid all these possible bugs because of uh, impure functions, that's probably worth it. You might figure out a more nuanced approach where actually you know a specific case, you wouldn't create any bugs anyway, uh, and then you can have a more sort of sophisticated approach to it. But as you want to start refactoring stuff more often and approaching these problems, I would definitely just say avoid mutation um, and that is easier to not break stuff with. Does anyone else have any questions? So the question is, um, if you think you can change something, you can uh, interact with that code and you can make improvements to it, but you don't know how far reaching the effects will be, what should you do? Uh, I think that really depends on, on the code itself. If you are looking at uh, code in an API and it's really simple and you've got like a service layer and you've got a repository layer and you're looking at a function in the service and all it does is it calls a function in the repository, um, then you can probably figure out what's going to happen there. You can look in, you can do a search in your IDE and you can figure out, well, this function is only called in one place and now I've got a full picture of the whole journey and I can see exactly what those changes will be. And that will be fine. You can just make that change test it afterwards, see that it does the same thing, happy days. If you're working on a library maybe which is uh, being used by some unknown number of other projects, then it gets a little bit more complicated. But hopefully the library code is written in such a way that you can at least figure out what the changes will be, if not how many people it will affect. Um, so I guess start there and also use uh, GitLens in Visual Studio Code because that will tell you exactly who wrote each line without you having to go off and find it. And then you can just go and ask that person. Um, I think that is, if you have any doubt, then that's the safest way. You can make a lot of mistakes without actually breaking anything because you can run code locally and you can make sure it's still executes in the same way. But if you do find yourself in a situation where you think, well, this is this definitely would be an improvement if it worked, but I'm unable to figure out whether it will break anything else on my own, then it's definitely worth talking to the other person and hopefully they will also see that. Um, you know, if you have a conversation, you spend five, 10, 15 minutes talking about that code, if that is gonna improve code, then great. And the situations where you're not sure about what the effects will be are probably situations where more people are using it and therefore the improvement will be better because it will infect more people anyway. So I definitely err on the side of making the change and doing whatever you need to do to be able to do that comfortably rather than backing away from it and checking it out. Cool. Then I guess that's it.
Oh, more applause.